This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Yes! Let's get ready to rumble! (laughs) (laughs) I think we're going to get sued for that. (laughs) (laughs) Oops, forget that part. We're live! (laughs) Hi! Hi, everybody! There's already a lot of activity in the uh, chat room here on YouTube. So, hi, guys. Welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for going in there and already participating without us. (laughs) Yes, and uh, hopefully we will get to some of your questions and or comments (laughs) because you've already got a backlog going. So, thanks. Now, that's great. We we love it when people participate. So, thank you. Yes, and... And if you want to send us any questions through Twitter, you can do that too. Send it to Trek FM and send it with a hashtag live the edge. Yes. So anyway, maybe for first time viewers, we should introduce ourselves. I'm Brandy. Hi, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hi, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Bruce with a couple more pounds. I'm sorry. I'm just, I weighed myself this morning. I'm just depressed by it. Hey, 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 hey. Weight is just a number. How you look is what is more important. How you feel you look is what makes it important. I don't think I look good either, so. (laughs) Yeah, well, at least you don't have a disease that actually typically makes you fat. So there. Okay. Well, there you go. (laughs) Actually, it doesn't necessarily make you fat. Well, uh, it makes weight very easy to gain and very hard to get off. So thanks, PCOS. You're great. Uh, anyway, we are supposed to have a special guest who has not joined us yet. So if someone just drops in in the middle, you guys will know why. So, all right. So we are here tonight to discuss episode eight. eight. That's what I'm going to call Trek. it. Episode eight. eight. Cause it's episode got a eight. weird Latin title. It does have a weird Latin title, which I am now going to butcher. Si vis pacem parabellum. Which means, if you want peace, prepare for war. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. sounds like a great title for this episode. I wonder if they sat there and they said, how about if we call it, if you want peace, prepare for war. Wait, let's make that in Latin. Well, it's a very famous Latin phrase, so that's not really a surprise. True. But, and things, plus, you know, for the people who don't know what it means, they're all going to Wikipedia and looking it up, and maybe they're a little more educated than they were before that episode. So, yeah. win win. I don't know. So, I took Latin to, I think, two years of Latin in high school, and hi, Tootie. Tootie was my Latin teacher, by the way. If anybody's listening who knows who I'm talking about, you have to, <laughs> like, tweet me or something. But anyway, uh, she used to give out what we, she called magic pencils. And so if you did something really great in class, she'd give you a magic pencil and it had a Latin phrase on it. And I had one. I still have it to this day. And it's ubio ubi est meus sub ubi. And that means where or where is my underwear? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember from Latin. <laughs> Uh, the only thing that that reminds me of is my accelerated science teacher that I had when I was in seventh grade, whose name was Mr. Herman, and he was from New York. And he would give out treats for right answers. So sometimes he would give out a hotsy totsy, don't burn yourself, or an icy cold, Uber. or he would give you a pencil untouched by human hands. We'd say, Mr. Herman, you're human, you've touched the pencil. And he'd say, no, I'm superhuman. 
He was a great teacher. <laughs> wow. He was my favorite, my favorite science teacher. They're the ones time. you always remember. That's why they're yep. great. He's number one. Professor Diring, right behind him, just basically cuddled up against him at number two. So two great science teachers I had. Anyway, so science. Science. All right. So let's talk about this episode. Yes, let's. Because I just want to say that Harry uh, Michelson uh, says episode eight is the ninth Star Trek episode to have a Latin title. Thank you for that, Harry. We appreciate that. Or is it Mickelson? Trivia. It's Mickelson, not Michelson. Mi- M- I have, I have Michael Burnham on the brain. Well, we're going to talk about Michael Burnham, so that is only appropriate. Only appropriate. Somebody's here from Edinburgh? Oh, my heavens. It's two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but, oh, I'm so sorry you've been hospital hospitalized. <laughs> hospitalized i can read uh i'm glad you're free so (laughs) welcome welcome to the uh live show okay so uh what are your initial thoughts about this episode oh you had to ask me that i've been dreading that question all day Um, oh come on it's just me okay and a bunch of other people so um i i knew that Kirsten Beyer, who writes many of the Voyager novels and who has been on Literary Treks, which is a show that I co-host with Dan Gunther. I got to go back and listen to that one. (laughs) She's been on several, actually. I got to go back and listen to all of them. She hasn't been on any that I've been on. Since I've been on Literary Treks, she hasn't been on the show because they keep delaying the publication of her next Voyager novel ever since she went to go do Discovery. But I have talked to her and met her in person just recently in Las Vegas, and we talked about Literary Treks, and we even talked a little bit about, you know, how this episode was coming. And, And I've heard so much about this episode that I was looking as forward to this episode as I was the premiere of Discovery. So I've been dying to get to this episode and I really did enjoy it, but I think I was anticipating it so much that it was like, I I thought I was going to, someone led me to believe that I would cry and I didn't cry. So I was disappointed that I didn't cry in the episode. Did you cry Brandy? No, No. you didn't. And you're a crier. I am a big crier. (laughs) Believe me. I, I cried during Thor Ragnarok, and it wasn't even during a sad part. It was just because I was so freaking excited. So, <laughs> I saw that, too. That was good. Yeah. I'm just saying, I cry really easily, and there was nothing in this episode that would make me cry. So, maybe in part two, or excuse me, in episode nine. See, I got because... Harry Michelson's name right. <laughs> anyway, the first time. <laughs> uh, anyway, go on. I'm sorry. So, yeah, uh, I it a lot of people, I think, feel the same way that this seemed like definitely not a standalone episode, that it was obviously meant to be part of the second part of this coming episode nine, which is where the break will happen is after episode nine, because eventually uh, initially they were going to stop at episode eight Mm -hmm. and then come back with episode nine. And then they thought narratively it made more sense to have episode eight and nine uh, before the break. And now I can see why, because I think if we had to go about what, I guess it's about nine weeks with just episode eight, oh, the fan theories would run rampant. It would, everyone would go crazy. Well, I also didn't feel that it was that strong of a cliffhanger to make us wait. I mean, we know it, it, there is a bit of a cliffhanger to it, but it's not as big as like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I mean, obviously we know they're going to fight. Mm-hmm. So, Well, with me, cliffhangers rarely pay off at the beginning of the second episode of the cliff, you know, the two parter, like best of both worlds. Okay. Last thing you see in episode first part, first episode is Riker saying fire. And what happens in the beginning of the second episode? Oh, that that had no effect on the Borg ship. Wah, wah, wah. So I hate I kind of hate cliffhangers like that. It's like build up, build up, build up. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Just come on, <laughs> give me a little Especially more. Especially when they play that sound at the end <laughs> of the cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so. 
Well, and wait, Becky. Okay, hold on. Becky, uh, 2010 Abel says, I thought we were going to lose Saru based on the previously released preview. Did the preview show like Saru look like he see he was going to die? Not to me. I don't remember. But then I, you know, it's discovery is one of those things where I never know really what is going to happen. So it is entirely possible that Saru could have died, but the thought never actually occurred to me. I never felt like that was going to happen. So, yeah, I thought maybe he would come close to dying or something of that nature or something really bad was going to happen. But I never at any time thought he was going to die from that preview. No, I I don't either. I don't remember. I guess maybe I just didn't assumed he wasn't going to die. So, but I did think I was going to cry, but it didn't happen. But apparently two ladies did in a hospital room. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at reading names but is it Jiru, Jiru Grace J- maybe it's Jiu, Jiu? Jiu Grace well, I don't know what I'm saying I, I need reading glasses now oh mister I don't have to wear contacts and now needs reading glasses mm-hmm. I'm just saying that as an excuse okay <laughs> <laughs> oh we are on one tonight because we're missing our guest. Our guest co-host didn't show up. Where is he or she? <laughs> we may never know. Might find out later. I don't know. Probably. Probably after the fact. So, yeah. Um, so, we... Uh, how did this episode start? I know Gosh. how it started. Because I was going to say, we had no cold opening. Again. Yeah, again, we had no cold open. No cold open. And we just had and previously on. Previously and then on. Credits. Survivor. And then we, because I just watched Survivor, that's why I had to say that. Previously on Survivor. <laughs> so Klingons, and I watched on CBS All Access, by the way. So Klingons were attacking the USS uh, Gagaron. Yeah. Yeah. And they were really taking a pounding. Yeah. Because there were lots of Klingon ships ganging up on one Starfleet ship. Which, uh, you know, if, if I were a better Star Trek fan, I would know exactly what class and designation that that ship is. But quite frankly, I haven't had time to look up all of those details before this podcast. That's one thing I want to uh, complain about is uh, I've, we've seen other ships, but I never feel like we really get a chance to really see the ship. They're just like going by so fast. It's like I really want a good look at the ships and I didn't get and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what class it is either. But I really wanted to get a better look at the ship for a longer period of time, but didn't. And I was always hoping that the bridges of the different ships would look different, but they all look <laughs> like the the Discovery like Bridge. Like the regret, but, the redressed Discovery Bridge? Yeah, yeah. but, you know, mm-hmm. I get it, too. They, they don't have, like, a million bridges on the set that they can use, so. That's true, but at the same time, I have seen uh, things where they use the same... Uh, in other movies and television and such where they have used the same set but redressed it in such a way that you would never know that was the same set in a million years you would have thought oh no that's totally different set of course why wouldn't it be you find out no 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 we took this and we just put this there and this there and put up this wall now it's different so (laughs) i don't know or maybe they just really liked conformity yeah maybe well, and Excelsior says in the chat that we finally had a great battle scene where you could actually see the ships. And I do agree. I could definitely see the ships better than I could in the previous battle like we had in episodes like one and two. But um, still, I just, I don't know. I just want to gawk at them a little longer. Just look at them. Yes. Well, we can go back and watch the episode and pause it every few seconds. You know what I really can't wait for is hmm. when we get a Star Trek Discovery visual dictionary. If that mm. if they ever decide to do one. Why wouldn't they? They really should. Oh, I would love hey, it. CBS. You better license that, okay? Get going on that. We want it. Come on. Discovery yes. visual dictionary. Gimme. Want to see all those ships? Come on. <laughs> Bring on the Come ships. Come on, man. Come on. Give me the ships. So, Give me the ships. Okay. Here's your ship. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want I want everyone to know I was saying ships, not something else. Oh, we we know what kind of ships you're talking about. So, oh, yeah. okay, so Stamets 
is doing the spore drive thing. And when he comes out of the drive, Tilly says, are you feeling okay there, Lieutenant? And he's like, what? Wait, what? What are you doing here, Captain? What was your thought? Mm -hmm. What did you think when he said that? I thought, well, he's obviously seen another timeline or a possible future because time is all the same in the quantum reality uh, where she has achieved her goal of being a captain. And he is getting to the point, it seems, where he doesn't always know which, which reality he's in when he comes out of that chamber. Right. So that's, that can be scary. And obviously he is scared because he was just really... Rawr, Kind of like he was in the early episodes, and he's back to being stressed out Stamets, and it breaks my heart because I really love cool, hip, and groovy Stamets. <laughs> so, and I'm sure he much preferred that, but now things are starting to muddle in his mind, and he's not really sure where he is anymore. So, I loved Tilly's solution to it is that she just badgered him until he talked about it because that is her deal. She will badger you until she gets it out of you. But you can also count on her. You know, she was like, okay, we're going to keep uh, monitoring your symptoms and keep monitoring all this and document everything. You know, she was just totally, she totally had his back. So, and that's, that's what we know Tilly for. She's got your back. You know, she is always badgering people, not in a bad way, but she's always trying to get them to confess things and open up about things. <laughs> and so she should be a counselor. She, oh, she could be a counselor, but I feel that she would talk about herself too much. <laughs> so, you know, because she would say, oh, yeah, that reminds me of this time when, you know, just because I don't know if she could maintain that professional level of, of being slightly distant, you know, being an observer instead of being involved in everybody's problems, because Tilly seems to me like a fixer. She wants to, if somebody has a problem, she wants to help you fix it. Yes. And that's what she does. And she is relentless in her offers of help. <laughs> She's a relentless helper, which I think actually is a good thing because some people give up far too easily. And they actually need someone like Tilly to just keep going, nope, I'm going to help you. Do you like it or not? going to help you. <laughs> not going anywhere. going to help you. Gonna help you. Well, it sounds like uh, other people here in the chat they like the idea of a Captain Tilly, and that Tilly has many, has many, may live many more years. And Ron, why are you saying that Dan Gunther knows too much? <laughs> <laughs> Dan Gunther says, "Great example. The courtroom in The Measure of a Man was the same set as the TNG Battle Bridge." <laughs> Ah, I win. <laughs> I don't know what I win. I win my point. <laughs> that Dan Gunther guy. Uh, if you ever want to listen to him, he's on literary tracks with this doofus named Bruce Gibson. So. Oh, no, no, no. Bruce is not a doofus. Don't listen to anything that Bruce says about Bruce because Bruce is not a doofus. I just feel like my hair is like, not doing my thing today. Okay. <laughs> 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 my hair. Tilly, if you were here to counsel me on my hair, I would really appreciate it. Okay, so one thing I have a problem with this episode, I'm all over the place today. It's been one of those days. Yeah. One, and for you too. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we weren't together and it's just, so still, we both had that kind of day. So Hundreds of miles apart. Hundreds, hundreds still. and hundreds of miles apart. So yeah. one thing I had a problem with this episode, and I'm talking about the whole episode at this point, is... I loved the Saru centric plot line. I loved the brief scenes that we got with Tilly and Stamets as that would be like the B plot line. I didn't, it's not that I didn't like the Klingon plot line, but it just didn't seem, it seemed jarring. Like it just didn't connect with the rest of the episode for me. I would have preferred if that was saved maybe for a different episode and we just stuck with what was going down on the planet and what was going on in the ship. Mm -hmm. It just seemed so I, weird to go from the planet to this Klingon ship somewhere where, you know, uh, Laurel's, you know, fighting with Cole about something or whatever. It's like it just didn't connect with the rest of the story. Now, maybe when we get to the next episode, it seems more connected. But through this, it didn't for me. Yeah, I can understand that. And for a good while after initially watching this episode, I tried to decide how I felt about it. Because 
all of the other episodes of Discovery up to this point, for me, it's been very easy to say, oh, yeah, I loved this episode and here's why. And this episode seems, um, it seems unfinished, which is, you know, obvious to, I think, everybody as to why they're having episode nine now instead of in January, because all of this episode was leading up to this thing that didn't even happen in this episode. <laughs> so it's like, oh, the Klingons are coming. The Klingons are coming. Because these guys down on the planet think, oh, let's just get you guys together and talk. Because then you can talk out your differences. And it will be fine. <sighs> uh, they're adorably naive. <laughs> the Pavo are adorably naive. Um, so... <laughs> But uh, but no, I, I agree with the Klingon bits because there were, it just didn't seem the right episode to put it in. It seemed like it was part of another jigsaw puzzle. Like, here is this picture we were working on and there are all these other pieces that have nothing to do with the picture we're working on, was how I felt about it as well. And so now, as long as we're talking about the Klingon stuff... Um, what do you think is really going on with Laurel? Do you think that she has a plan and everything that happened was part of that plan? Or just is she just winging it? Mm, uh, I, I, I think with this episode, I felt that she was maybe just winging it. Especially when she took Cornwell out into the corridor as if they were going to leave. And then she got seen by Cole. And then she and Cornwell fought. And, and and did whatever. So I I don't know. Maybe maybe she's more clever than I think. But I uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I think she's getting to where she needs to go, but it's not going exactly as planned. Yeah, I can see that. Um however I don't think Cole was the first one to see her. There was another Klingon with him that yeah. I think walked into the hallway first. And so I I am of the opinion that she is way smarter than we think she is. And that the whole thing was a ruse to make Cornwall look dead so that it would be easier for them to escape. Okay, so let's go there. Is Cornwall okay. dead? I sincerely hope not. And of course there were you know, I'm watching the body really, really carefully and I'm like, no. She's definitely breathing, but maybe that's just because she can't hold her breath very long. <laughs> I, just, I just don't know. But uh, I feel like there's there's a part of me that even wants to take that conspiracy theory further and say that they they staged all of that just so that she had a reason to go to basically their uh, low-grade morgue. Right. So that she could get in there and see who was really in there. And then she sees basically all of her comrades and it confirms her worst fears, of course. And uh, so I don't know. I think that I think that that faking Cornwell's death and putting her in there was part of the plan. I can't explain that now because I don't know all the particulars, but it feels to me like everything she's done, she's done absolutely according to how she wanted things to go. The interesting thing, I think, is things that she said when she talked to Cornwell when she was still in her cell, and she talked about Voak and how he was forever gone. Mm. Forever gone were the words she used. Hmm. Where did he forever go? Inquiring minds want to know. But if he's hey, that forever gone, then that means... He he forever won't come back. I know, but still, we have to find out where he went, why he went, all of these things. There's still so many unanswered questions about Vogue. Well, and... Yeah. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well if, he's, if he's not Ash Tyler, then I am going to need some more answers. Well, in, uh, on Twitter, we have at Holbach R saying, my initial thought was that she was using Cornwell to reunite with Ash Vokler. <laughs> not Tyler, <laughs> Vokler. <laughs> so, <laughs> Renee, that's at Holbach R, thinks Ash 
Tyler is Vogue. And then we have Brandon Shane Matala saying, I don't believe Laurel wants to defect, but I do believe Admiral Cornwell is dead with an explanation point, by the way. Well, we'll see. I don't know. I don't think she, I don't know. I don't know if she's dead. I, I, I guess I'm leaning towards she's not. I feel like she's not because Laurel does not want her talking. And the only way to ensure that they don't keep interrogating her, because eventually everybody talks. Everybody talks. And so I think that that was the only safe way to protect her from further interrogation. That's my theory. I think, uh, I think you're right. I think I I have to agree with you on that. Um, and I see some other people think that, uh, Cornwell is still alive and, and, and poor Jew grace, uh, the nurse caught him like, and had to stop listening to the podcast. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Bummer, bummer, bummer. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, and Dan Gunther mentions that she name-dropped Discovery. Is she trying to get onto Discovery and reunite with Ash to take the ship from within? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm still leaning towards that Ash is not Vogue. You know, we could have that conversation on every episode that we do. Yes. Let's just say we don't want him to be Vogue, okay? We don't want that. It wouldn't be a surprise. And we love Ash Tyler. Please let us just have Ash Tyler. Why are you hurting me like this? <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. I really hope so because I just, you know, Ash Tyler was everything I never knew I needed in Discovery. <laughs> so he's just really found a place in my heart. And uh, yeah. So, and we got to see more of him in this episode, which I appreciated. And so, but yeah, as far as the Klingon stuff, agree that it was jarring. I still think Laurel has a plan and I think Admiral Cornwell is alive. I really hope she is because I like the actress Jane Brooke very much. Yes. And I hope that Laurel figures out what color her eyes are because it seemed to me that her eye colors changed. Well, I don't know if her eye colors changed, but the eye on the side where she was injured, I think, was also injured and therefore isn't quite the same. So I think that that eye was damaged and that why it looks, that's, that's why it looks like it's a different color. That's correct. But in a later <laughs> scene, I swear both of her eyes are blue. Well, here's the funny thing. Unless it's healed. Um, <laughs> here, here's the funny thing about eyes is that... All eyes are actually basically brown, but it's only how light reflects off of them that make us think that we're seeing different colors. So my eyes aren't really green. They're actually brown. But because of the way the light reflects off of all of those things in my irises, I know that there's a word for it. I can't think of it right now. It just, uh, me, yeah. 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 <laughs> I have blue eyes, baby. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> oh my. So basically, gosh. different different light, different light, different um, direction of light. You know where it's coming from, what the source is, will make eyes look different. That's just normal, really. People are worried in the chat that if uh, ashes Vogue, that this would really hurt and kill Burnham, because she really does have trust issues. Well, of course she has trust issues. Look where she came from. I mean, she she hasn't had anybody to trust for a while. So, and uh, yeah, she trusted Giorgio, but... And she's never been in it, love. Yeah, she's never been in love. That's not a surprise. I mean, I don't think that that's surprising at all. Actually, during that scene from the previous episode, when she tells Stamets her secret... My husband immediately said, she's a virgin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. I hope it's... She may not have been in love, but that doesn't mean she's a virgin. <laughs> I know, but, but that was his guess, is that she had never, you know, she was a virgin because she had, you know, never known love. But Yeah, I, I, would, yeah. I would, if I was a betting man, I'd say she's probably a virgin. Yeah. 
Oh, that poor, poor, poor girl. Mm, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so let's let's move on to the stuff happening on the planet with the Pavo. Yes. The, the Palvo planet, where the trees, <laughs> the rocks, the grass, they all vibrate with the tune. They're all communicating. And there's this tower-like structure that's made of like a glass that, that takes those waves. And they could use that to determine where the cloaked, I'm sorry, the invisible Klingon ships are. Because they, they never refer to them as cloaked. Our Starfleet crew, no. crew refers to them as invisible ships. Well, they probably don't have a lot of experience with uh, cloaked ships at this point, so they don't really know the word, is my guess. They don't know that right. that's its designation, which mm, that's fine with me. I mean, it's it's early in, in Starfleet's history, relatively early, not like super early, not like Enterprise NX-01 early, but still early. And... The, the tower itself, I thought it was weird when they showed it from a distance. I thought, well, gosh, if that's a naturally occurring tower, that that's really weird because it looks awfully man-made from a distance. And then when you get there, you know, it, you see it's not really exactly straight. It's just a trick of perspective. And it, it basically looks like a bunch of naturally forming crystals just came out of the rock and just kept growing upward like a beanstalk. Or did they coerce it? Did the pavo coerce it? Because everything else with the pavo seems more natural. The trees and the grass and the rocks and all that stuff. The, so the structure well, doesn't. Yeah, well, it, it really is, though, because crystal is part of rock, which is part of nature. So in that respect, yeah, it's it's still a natural formation, but I feel like because the Pavo are the planet. Or if you're a Final Fantasy VII fan, it's the life stream. Anyway, <laughs> because they're part of the planet, everything is one. Absolutely everything is one. So they can basically do whatever they want. They could build any kind of structure that they wanted, and they built a tower. Hmm. I wonder why they chose those crystals in that color, I wonder. I don't know. Because they really like blue. Hmm. I wonder if they're kyber crystals from Star Wars. <gasps> Ooh, let's go. We could make some lightsabers. Oh, because, <laughs> right. you know, it's hard to get your hands on kyber crystals now. Because they sing, just like yeah. the planet yeah. sings. Yeah, because right? that's why Kylo Ren's lightsaber is all crackly and spitty. It's because he's got a cracked kyber crystal, man. It's, yes. <laughs> so sorry. So, excuse so us. sorry. So welcome to live from the force. So <laughs> Excelsior says I think they're trying to create. Oh, we see now. Just left the screen. Hold up. Hold up, everyone. Just give me a moment Holding. here. Okay. He says I. I. I well, I don't know he or she, right? I don't know Excelsior. Hmm. I think that they are trying to create moral equivalence between uh, Burnham's. Burnham's mutiny and Saru's portrayal to put them on the same level. And then Becky says, Burnham treated Saru much better when he betrayed the group than Saru treated Burnham. Yes, and that's because Burnham knew what it felt like. So she was taking the high road because she knows how it feels to be that one who is shunned and hated by everyone. And she was not going to perpetuate that. So way to go, Michael Burnham. Way to show maturity. I am proud of you, girl. I kind of hope that they have a, a falling out situation where she, he's like, you know, Burnham, I can't trust you. And she's like, really, Saru? What about when we were on Palvo? What about how you were? See how I treated you? We're both equal here. One for one. And he goes, okay. Let me stroke your cheek one more time. <laughs> Like you did on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the thing is, it's just unnecessary because all you're doing is exacerbating the, what's the word I'm looking for here? Antagonism between them that she doesn't want. She doesn't want that relationship anymore. She was terrible to him when they were on the Shinzo and she knows it and she's admitted to it. She doesn't want to be that person anymore. Now she wants to 
have some measure of respect again. And so taking another person down for behaving that way is not going to get her any further down that path. So what she did was absolutely really mature. And it also was illogical. So she's finally starting to get out of that logical mindset that she has seemingly all the time and have emotions and have empathy and sympathy. And that is something that I think is really hard. It's it's a difficult thing to navigate when you are not used to those emotions. So I still say, way to go burn them. I wonder if Ash Tyler and her feelings for him are also helping her express emotions. Well, and also because of what happened in, the pre, in that other episode with Sarek, I think really had her come to terms with herself and she could loosen up a little more and be more herself and not carry that weight that she had that she didn't serve uh, Sarek's uh, expectations. Right. I think that that was the tipping point for her. And so now she's trying to navigate that ridiculous labyrinth that is human emotion. And she's she's wading in. She's wading in, you know, leaving a real trail of pebbles behind her so she can find her way back out. Because if you use breadcrumbs, man, the birds are just going to come and eat them. Come on. Have we learned nothing from Hansel and Gretel? <laughs> so... But I think that uh, her feelings for Ash are definitely helping with that and vice versa. Her having feelings for Ash is a progressive step forward and allowing herself to act on those feelings and receive feelings from him. Uh, it's it's almost like a symbiotic relationship. So he he helps her express her emotions. And because he's helping her express her emotions, she can express her emotions to him. Etc. Yeah. Such as when he talks about the boathouse and she's the boathouse. I'm gonna end up back in prison while you're at your boathouse. And then they kiss. Mm-hmm. So now the kiss has really happened where they will remember it. <laughs> That's exactly what I said when it happened. <laughs> oh, come on, all of us were really saying that. Oh now when they'll remember. I wasn't expecting and- it this soon. I thought, oh, yeah, it happened in that last episode when it was a different timeline that got reset, and now we're going to have to wait, like, probably five or six episodes before they'll actually kiss again. But it happened in the next episode. It happened in this one. They're really moving fast. For someone who's never been in love, boy, pew, she's she's going fast. <laughs> hey, once you get a taste of it, you want to jump in with both feet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Forget about wetting yourself down before getting in the pool. Just jump in! So um, I feel like we don't know how much time has passed between that episode and this episode. Oh, that's a good point. For us, it's only been a week. <laughs> For them, it could have been a month. That's true. Oh, see, now I want to know. I definitely want to know right? what that time frame is. Yeah. But I could have swore that last week, or maybe it was the week before, uh, there was a star date that be- began with a two, where this one began with a one. So it seemed like the star date went back again. I, I may be wrong, but I thought we had like a star date of, I don't know, 13 something or another. And then we went to like 21 something or another and then back to like 14 something or another. Well, to be fair, I have never understood star dates. No one does. <laughs> so there we go. The only time I ever, ever understood uh, star dates was in Enterprise because they said the freaking month and day and year. <laughs> yes. So. I was like, what's wrong with saying the month and day and year? I think so, uh, the star date for... Oh, no, wait. I don't think they said a star date in the cage. But they had a star date in the very po- first... The second pilot of Star Trek. And I think it was like 1312. I'm just throwing it out there because I want to see if the chat like knows off the top of their head. Where no man has gone before. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so I think my hair actually does look pretty good now that I'm looking again. Okay. You look fabulous, darling. Fabulous. Oh, thank you, darling. Um, oh, you're welcome, speaking darling. of darling, my youngest daughter is like so into Green Acres and she goes around the house going, oh, darling, oh, darling. <laughs> green Acres? Yes, Green Acres. <laughs> For some reason, she found it online and she started watching Green Acres all the time. And she'll go around the house going, Oliver, Oliver, oh, darling. Anyway. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. 
I bet this is the first time that Green Acres has come up in a Star Trek podcast. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here for that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, wow. I, I, think, I think we should talk about Saru. Yes, let's talk about Saru. We were trying to get to that, and we got sidetracked by kissing. <laughs> Saru hasn't been kissing anyone, as far as I <laughs> no. know. I don't know how he would. His lips are kind of just, like, not really flexible. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's true. Maybe they kiss differently. I don't know. Maybe maybe they don't kiss at all. Maybe they're like denobulans that just like to sniff each other really close. <laughs> yes. Or maybe they're like Ferengi and they like to rub e- each other's ears. He doesn't have much ears either. Or maybe they take fingers like Vulcans and rub them together. That That could be. We don't know. We do not know because we've never seen him. With uh, any kind of romantic feelings ever for anyone ever. Let's give Saru a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It doesn't matter. We don't know. Are they gender fluid? Don't know. I think they're probably male and female. I don't know how they reproduce. Let's find out. I want to know about the Kelpians. Come on. Oh, I'm sure we'll get an episode eventually about them. Oh, good. Because there is not enough known. Not enough. I want more. And I think that's one so, thing I was expecting from this episode because I knew it was going to be a Saru episode. And I thought we were going to find out more about them, but well, we did we, a little. We did in a way. Yeah, we, yeah. we um, we saw how far Saru would go to keep his measure of peace because he'd never felt at peace before for a second in his life. That's my favorite part when he revealed right? that. Oh, it broke my heart. See, but I didn't cry. I was hoping I to. didn't either. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't either. I just thought, oh, that breaks my heart. But it wasn't, I don't know. It just wasn't a crying emotional moment. It's, I still felt it. And I felt sympathy for him. Uh, because that's kind of what my entire grade school life was like. Not a single moment of peace. Tormented by bullies. It was fun. So, uh, yeah, I, I can sort of identify with getting that peace, finally, never knowing that you were ever going to have it. Now that he has it, he is not going to give it up. And the lengths that he would go to were scary. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 so I rewatched it today before we did the show. Because one of the thoughts I had was, did Saru act the way he did because he? this is the first time he has been without fear? And so he's very protective of wanting to be on this planet? Or was it because these this thing got into his head and, and kind of threw him? I, I kind of think it's a mixture of both. I think it's mm. the fact that he wasn't having any fear, but I think the planet infested him in a certain way, too. I don't know. Now I got feel like I would need to watch that one more time. Yeah, well, the thing was is that Saru admitted that they didn't change him. They didn't change him at all. They simply put him in harmony with the planet. And that got rid of all of his fear because there was nothing to fear. Everything was one. But didn't, didn't Burnham say to him also that that really wasn't you, Saru? that you really didn't have full control. Yeah, that's true. I kind of think it's, it's a mix of to, both or something, you know? Yeah, it's hard to say how much of it was outside influence and how much of it was Saru just being desperate to hold on to that bit of harmony. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't a bit of harmony. It was complete harmony. It was complete peace, according to him, which I don't think I could even fathom such a feeling. Because there's always something to be worrying about. <laughs> always. I'm a homeowner. Homeowner. It's always something to be worried about. <laughs> That's right. What a feeling. Um, I am rhythm now. <laughs> Speaking, oh, since we're doing music, I do have a music topic to bring up. Okay. So when we're at the tower and we're going through that whole situation where Burnham is trying to get a communication to Discovery and Saru is trying to stop her. There's a moment where she's down at the device trying to send the communication out right before Saru arrives. Like 
he, she sees him running, which I want to talk about that too. But she sees him running and she's at the device and the music that's playing in the background, I swear, sounds like it's music from the animated series. Really? It sounds like Aaron? that to me. Yes. Where's Aaron Harvey? Because I want to know. <laughs> and I'm going to go back and listen to it again. But it sounds, and I, I, can't, I can't make the music right now because I can't remember how it went. But I just remember no, hearing it and thinking, oh my gosh, that sounds like some of the music you hear in the animated series. You know, it's interesting that you would say that because now that you've said that and I'm thinking about it, I thought that the music sounded familiar. And I thought, well, it's probably a refrain I might have heard in a different context earlier in the episode. I didn't know. So, yeah, Aaron Harvey, get back to us on that. We would like to know. And we know how you love to talk about the animated series and rightly so. Right. Or Chris Jones. Maybe he'll talk about it on Notes from the Edge. Notes from the Edge. Coming out on Saturdays on Trek FM. This Saturday at a podcast catcher near you. Ooh, excellent. So, anyway, running. Saru runs, man. He's fast. Yeah, well, he's got hooves, so... And he's also a prey species, so yeah, he's going to be able to run. And according to what I have seen on the internet, he has about the same speed as a lion. The only earth creature that would be faster than him would be a gazelle. Hmm. But only slightly faster. Yeah, but I don't laugh when they run. I was laughing when he ran. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I man. Thought he Doug cute Jones. When he ran too. <laughs> oh, did you just want to saddle him up? No, I'm just kidding. We do not think that about Saru. We do not. We do not. We just think about how he could possibly kiss. <laughs> yeah. So, somebody in the chat room said ganglia. <laughs> Oh, it was Dan. <laughs> no, it wasn't Dan. Dan was talking about uh, everyone picturing Saru kissing. And uh, it was Automated Joy who said ganglia kissing. Yeah, I could see that. I don't know if I want to see that, but yes, I can see no, that. No, I don't, I don't mean I want <laughs> to see that. It means that on a yes. theoretical level, that could it's very work. very possible. Yes. Yeah. Like... <laughs> uh, Ion Trone says goodbye gold medals for humans in the Federation Olympics <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh boy and Automated so. Joy says happy spores <laughs> <laughs> yes Dan did Hello. explain that, that Saru kicks like a horse Dan would know because I think Dan's been kicked by a horse before in the head we don't talk about it. Oh, all right. I'm sure you weren't kicked in the head, right, Dan? Wink, wink. You know, it's funny when we talk about stuff and then we're watching the chat, there's a delay. So they don't respond right away to what we say. Yeah. <laughs> so I just hear, you know, I sit here holding my breath waiting to see what they're going to say next. Right. It's uh, well, it's one of those things where we're like, oh, freaking delay. But then when you think about it, you're like, I'm sitting on a device that is beaming my signal up to a satellite and then back down to broadcast. Yes. That in and of itself is an amazing thing. It is. So a few seconds delay. Oh, big whoop. Absolutely. And, and anybody who's listening to this as the recorded show. Why aren't you doing this live with us? It's fun. We've got a lot it's more so people. Like, words getting out. Yeah. We can hardly keep up with the comments in the chat on YouTube. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yes. So, is there anything else you want to cover with Saru? Uh, besides the harmony, the peace, the balance. Oh, did um, when they were in, what was that structure they were in? That was, that was there on the planet? Or was that something they put up? You know, it wasn't really clear. Uh, I'm going to guess it could have been something that the Pavo created for them to give them shelter from what I couldn't say because uh, there didn't seem to be any bad weather or insects or anything like that that were, you know, a nuisance. Because um, the Pavo, so, I think, led them into it, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I'll have to go back and look at it again. I had a point, but I've forgotten it now. Dang it. Oh, no. So, that's what happens when you're over 40. Oh, okay. I'll take your word for it. Uh Shut up. <laughs> Don't make me come over there. You will not like what happens when I get there. <laughs> 
So there was a was that also a rock in that shelter that they may have taken their phasers to to create heat? Yeah, th- that wouldn't have surprised me at all. Uh, that's what it looked like to me, but I wasn't sure if that's yeah. exactly what that was. Well, yeah, I would assume that that's just standard procedure. You know, why use tinder and flint when you have a phaser? <laughs> just heat up a rock. You're not burning anything away. You know, you're just heating up a rock. And then when it gets cold, you heat it up again and you're not destroying the environment. And everybody's happy. So they take a phaser to the rock. They and then the rock glows red and the heat comes from it. Do you think because Saru was connected to the palvo of the planet that he was like, oh, that hurts. Oh, I feel the burn. I'm feeling the burn. <laughs> That's an interesting point. <laughs> oh, I remembered what I was going to oh, say. Good. It Here's was a yurt. It, it was a yurt. They were in a yurt. Wait, what's a yurt? No, oh, it's basically like a TP, but it has this open thing in the middle and just, yeah. Uh-oh. Go look it up on the internet and it'll show you a picture. It'll be easier to understand. Wigwam was uh, was what Excelsior said. Pavian Wigwam. <laughs> 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 oh, and Dan says he seems, it seemed to glow at night if he was remembering correctly, so... Yeah, so not only was a place to uh, camp out, but glowy as well, so that if you have to go outside to answer nature's call, you can find your way back. I don't know. Why glow? (laughs) Well, because you need, because if it's dark, you need light. That's why. Gosh, answer my own question. Got it. I'm being quiet now because I feel like you can talk (laughs) yourself through something else. (laughs) I can talk myself through so many things and then talk myself back in and around and through. You don't want to be here for that, really. It will take way too long. True. <laughs> uh, okay, anything? I, I want to I ask the chat, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want us to cover? Um, because I think we've discussed quite a bit. I'm sure we've missed something. One thing I do want to mention is Stamets. When uh, This goes back to earlier when we were talking in the episode about Stamets and Tilly talking in the mess hall uh, mm. about how Stamets isn't saying anything to Dr. Colbert because it puts him in an awkward position where no matter what, you know, if he tells him what's going on with him and he has to report it or not report it, it's just going to hurt him regardless. It could hurt his career. So he's kind of keeping it to himself. So he's trying to yeah. protect his lover of this yeah. situation. And I totally understand that because it would be an impossible position for Culber to be in because he has his, you know, doctor patient relationship and yet he has to report anything that could possibly threaten the ship. So, yeah, he, it's I mean, he's going to find out regardless, but uh, poor Stamets. It must be so hard to not be able to talk about this really important thing with the one person that you are most connected to. That's just that's horrible. I mean, if there was stuff that I couldn't tell Dave, it would just be really hard on me. Dave's my husband, for those of you who don't know. Oh, I thought he was your dog. <coughs> no, I don't have a dog. I have a cat named Shinobi. <laughs> <laughs> he's a ninja. That's why he's named Shinobi. He has really furry feet, and so he's so silent. <laughs> he startles me frequently. We have twin cats, and their name. Uh, Cinder and Cupcake. (laughs) Oh. Uh, So anyway, um, Excelsior says in the chat, did you buy the reason for visiting Pavo? Seems odd that the antenna could detect every cloaked Klingon ship. Pretty weak. I guess my thought, my initial thought was, how did they even know about this planet to even determine that it could help them with these cloaked ships that there just seemed to be just recently finding out about like it was it seemed really convenient too convenient Mm. it is a bit convenient in the old star trek way Um, (laughs) so because yeah i'm just like how did they find out about this planet and well of course they're going to go down there and see what they can do because they assumed that the planet was uninhabited 
because there had never been any record of communication with the planet, but the planet itself has an intelligence. So that was interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like, how would they, I think, I don't know if they said for sure that it would do what they thought it would do, but that's what they were going down to find out is to investigate it and see if it is something that they could use blah, 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 techno babble. So I don't know. It does seem a bit forced. It does. But like you said, I mean, we've seen this in other Star Trek stuff and I, I always, Mm. the literary Treks person in me always thinks, Oh, there'll probably be a book that will explain all this later. (laughs) So exactly. And I will read that book. (laughs) So, Me too. Um, so we have any other comments in the chat? Let's. See. Yeah, Dan Gunther won't shut up. No, I'm kidding, Dan. I and Ron him. keeps saying the same um, thing over and over again, which we'll get to at the very end. Yes. Uh, so Dan says, "Do you think Lorca will fight for Pavo, or will he leave it to the Klingons? We might find out in the next episode just what kind of man Lorca is." Well, okay. I guess that's getting what Ron is hinting at. He thinks Lorca is a spy. Or hmm. is the spy, which I have been wondering myself because people there's been theories that, oh, Lorca's from the mirror universe and that's why he doesn't seem he seems more about war than about exploration and such. And I thought, well, maybe he's Vogue or Klingon spy or something. I don't know. Yeah. And I would go with uh, I would go with the Vogue thing if Cornwall hadn't known him for so damn long. So. Yeah, but she also said to him, you're not the same. You seem different. Well, yeah. I mean, he had to blow up an entire ship of his crew. Or and did he? That's, that's Ooh, where I'm know, thinking. Good point. I'm thinking he would go down with his ship, and he did. And then Voke took his identity and said that he did not go down with his ship. Or maybe we are just reading way too much into it and there's no spy at all. That could be too. Absolutely. 100%. We just don't know. I say we just... We're going to have to watch. We just go for the ride. And I do yep, like... I'm hanging on for the ride. And I do like something Ron just said in here also, because I thought about this too when they were doing with uh, Palvo. It reminded me of the Organians. Yes. So much. <laughs> So much. It's like, okay, the Organians are now going to manifest as humanoids and try this trick again to get Starfleet and the Klingons to stop fighting. Could these be Organians? In- Could the Organians TOS. originally be from this planet? I wonder. It's, it's possible. Anything's possible. Hmm. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting theory. A very good question to mull over. It is. Mm. Well, I think we're about done. It's it's an hour. Yeah, it is. It is an hour, and and our other, we are very sad. Our, our other <laughs> co-host didn't show up, so our guest okay. co-host. But that's okay. We're not going to call her out on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to um, to agree with that. We're not going to say names on the air. Well, that's just not cool. Anyway. All we know is she could be a spy. (laughs) She could totally be. She's Vogue. (laughs) She's Vogue. That's what happens. See, because, you know, we're suspecting all the male characters. Maybe Vogue was turned into a woman. He did go see those matriarchs. You don't know. You don't know. I really don't think that. (laughs) You never know. (laughs) Uh, I will... uh, go ahead and say that one last thing uh ion throne says that would be a nice troll if neither ash nor lorca were compromised yeah i would appreciate that i'm saying it's the person you least suspect yeah Chilly. <laughs> stella, stella. <laughs> this automated joy said stella stella is <laughs> <laughs> okay enough of that what are your final thoughts bruce um okay as i said at the beginning of the episode i really was looking forward to this episode and i really did think it was a good episode i was just i think i built the hype so much because i was so excited about uh 
Kirsten Byers' uh, first episode, and it was really good. I was just thinking I was going to be very emotionally connected to it, and I wasn't like I thought. But I did like to get. I did like that we got more insight in Saru. I like the fact that we had a episode with a landing party. Felt very Star Trek, exploring the planet, uh, dealing with uh, conversations about. Um, you know, the first contact and um, the prime directive order one. So I, I liked all of that again, the Klingon, it wasn't that I didn't like the Klingon storyline. It just felt forced or it just didn't seem to flow between the two storylines to me. Like it didn't connect, which it may connect b- better when we get to the next episode. So um, I didn't like it as much as the last, as last week. So episode seven is still my favorite. Yeah, I have a hard time picking a favorite, but I can tell you that this episode was not it, which is not to say that I didn't like it also, because I did, but it did feel a bit forced in some areas, and it did feel unfinished, because obviously it's meant to be, you know, joined with episode nine in Holy Matrimony or something. Um, Ooh, I'm tired. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) So, yeah, I... um, I am interested, of course, to see where it goes. This is just fueling the fire on a lot of other theories. And hopefully we'll find out a little bit more in the next episode. Uh, yeah, it's, they've given us a lot of little things. Now we, we need a big thing. We need a big thing at this midway point. Give us a big thing, Discovery. We need it now. Yeah, and we just have one more episode and uh, then we take a break for a while. Nine weeks. I can do it. It's fine. I can do it too. It's fine. I can do it too because I'll be spending a lot of time reading Star Trek books. <laughs> yeah. See, there you go. There's always that, and I I will have more time for watching Enterprise. I'm still getting trying to get through season two, so yeah, just uh, it's good times. Okay. So uh, before we go into my thingy thing that I usually do, I'm going to do this out of order, Dan. Leave us alone. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Dan is being very kind, and we appreciate you, Dan. (laughs) Ooh, ganglia. Uh, (laughs) Thanks to everybody who joined us in the live chat. It was a lot of fun seeing so many of you there. And so uh, for everyone who may not know where to find you, Bruce, where can people find you besides the live show? You can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And as I mentioned several times, I do literary treks with Dan Gunther here on the Trek FM network. And you can find me talking Star Wars on the Star Wars Report with Riley Blanton and Mark Herleman. And that is on StarWarsReport.com. So check it out. Check it out, guys. As for me, you can find me on Twitter as Brandywine12, which is Brandy with an I and wine spelled the traditional way, number 12. And I am always in and out of the Babel Conference. Uh, I do work for a living, so sometimes I'm not on there as much as maybe I'd like to be. And I do a podcast with my husband, Dave, called The Dark Corner Podcast, and we look at pop culture and other things through a uh, darker lens. And this last episode that we did was a commentary on the 1980 movie Flash Gordon. And man, we had a really good time with that. (laughs) We had an excellent time with that. Uh, So yeah, go on over to strangeanddeadly.com or iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts and look for the Dark Corner podcast if you want to check that out. It is not for children. So, all that is left for me to do is to say these things that I always do. So be sure to check out our Discovery coverage throughout the week. Live from the Edge airs on Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern. Duh, you're watching it. And will be released as a podcast on Tuesday mornings. Our commentary will be available as Tracks from the Edge on Wednesday. We'll discuss your feedback on Postcards from the Edge on Thursday. And you can catch full analysis on The Edge main show on Friday. And to wrap up the week, join us for Notes from the Edge on Saturday with our own Chris Jones for links between Discovery and the broader franchise. We already plugged that earlier. Please really do check these things out because you'll find all of these in the main feed for The Edge and in the Trek.fm master feed. So now we'd love to hear your 
thoughts on discovery. And of course, the best place to do that is the aforementioned Babel Conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook, where Amy Nelson collects your feedback for postcards from the edge. You can also find us on Twitter at Trek FM or send us email using the contact form on our website at trek.fm forward slash contact. Choose, choose to send to a show and choose the edge. So, of course, we'd like to thank our lovely and talented associate producers who are Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Paleo, Lisa Slack, Shoa Mirza, and Richard Rutledge. So if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows going and keep coming to you live so you can look at our glorious visage and even become an associate producer, then visit patreon.com forward slash trekfm for all the details. Wow, I love how you change these up every episode. <laughs> well, got to keep it interesting, man. Got to keep them listening. The edge. And last week it was what? <laughs> it was my Dracula voice. No, that's right. <laughs> well, I was actually last week when I was doing those parts about the edge. Oh, that's it. But then, this is a comrade. But then when I got, yes, we would check out all the things, all the Babel Conference. <laughs> oh. I don't know why I do that so well. I blame my husband. Blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. That's about all I can do. Well, we're done. Yeah. We're, we're but we're done. still live. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can I can fix that. So anyway, <laughs> thank you again <laughs> to, <laughs> to everyone. We'll be back. Uh, oh, by the oh. way, uh, Ion Trone says the earliest it can return is January 7th. According to IMDb, the next episode after episode nine will air on January 14th. That sounds right. So that's why I'm saying nine weeks is because that's... Pretty much about nine weeks. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so hope to see you all again next week. And uh, come join us on the Babel Conference in the meantime. And get that get that subscription to the Master Feed, man. It's the way to go. So you get everything. So thank you so much. And this is Dan. Why do I keep mentioning Dan? You need You're to obsessed. stop jumping up you in there. You are obsessed with Dan tonight. It's because... I've never gotten to talk to him, so. <laughs> well, you'll just have to come on Literary Tracks, and we'll take care of that. Yeah, well, I'm game anytime you guys are. So, uh, this I'm saying goodbye. Brandy's saying goodbye. Bruce is saying yes. goodbye. Say goodbye, Bruce. Goodbye, Bruce. <laughs> Perfect. See you guys later. Bye-bye.